Is there one coming from the seats or is there still people outside? Okay, um, welcome to the second Teach Me Havering. Uh, before um, I kind of get proceedings going, I'm just going to um, ask Kim O'Neill, who's the teacher at St. Carl, who's allowed us to, to use the, the uh, child chapel today and welcome us to us all to just say a few words. Um, not that they don't want to, they've tried to, but they can't. Um, 
Um, but they have got a few other things going on this evening. Um, first of all, uh, we will have a break at about quarter past six. Um, let's go get some more food, some more drinks, toilets, and so on. Um, between now and then, you've got a few things um, to, to do. First of all, there is a box at the front. Um, this is a book of slips. You should have one on your chair. Um, we are going to be doing a, a draw later on for some trucks from one of our sponsors, um, Crown House Publishing. Um, so you get in with a chance of winning one of the lovely books up at the front. Um, you've also got a bingo card. Um, and I think you can probably already tick off some of the words um, on that. Um, as you can see there, let's get back one. Um, with the bingo, uh, we've got three prizes in total. Okay. Um, we'll give the first and second line, it can be vertical, horizontal or diagonal, um, and also the full house. Okay, um, and so um, that is um, quite exciting for us. Uh, whilst people are presenting, please don't interrupt and shout and wait to the end. Um, we have got enough prizes that if it's a draw, um, we, can, we can find some way of sorting it out. We have also got some uh, lovely twinkle mugs. Um, that they have uh, provided for us. Um, these were in point one last time and they've sent even uh, better quality ones. Uh, so we're going to be running some competitions um, for that. And um, what I would ask um, is, is actually these are our sponsors tonight. They've paid for the food, they've paid for the wine, um, they've sent us lots of prizes. Um, I'm sure as many of you have got very excited about the goodies on your seat because they were free. Um, and obviously um, we can't do um, teaching events without trying to support our sponsors. Um, so we need to say a big thank you to them. Um, if you are on Twitter, um, some of their um, uh, accounts up there, it would be great if you can um, tweet them. Um, I think we should have a competition in this first half, which could not come up. I think we'll give away three for the three best reasons that people deserve a cup. So if you could uh, tweet with the hashtag um, TMHabro, uh, Martin will give half my own there. Uh, if you want one of these, give us a reason uh, and we will have to give you one. Okay, uh, without further ado, we're going to start with our first presentation. Give me a break, so I'm ready to get on there. Yes, thanks. Get a tweet now. Okay. Maybe we should give them on to the first person um, to tweet the reason as well. We give away four minutes. That's all right. We give it away once in. Without further ado, um, we are going to line up our first two presentations um, using our random name generator. Okay. Actually, it's probably got you first a bit, so we'll reset it. I appreciate it. Hands coming up, fantastic. 
So, uh, as you will see, um, not every presentation, but some of the presentations will have a few technical hitches. At that point, do feel free to entertain yourselves, and um, obviously, um, you don't have to keep listening to me because this is going to get very short, very quickly, and you can probably tell. So, I'm not going to speak quite to ask you something for a joke just yet, but um, there are a couple of things on your chairs which may interest you, obviously, the sponsor stuff. A couple of things also, this is something that I am involved with, I wasn't going to talk about this. Is there anyone in the room who's learned solo taxonomy? They know the word, they can 
Yeah, put the hand up there, put the right there, putting the hand up. Apart from trying to avoid Tom to the front. You should know, you've heard this talk at least three times. Oh, I should pay attention. <laughs> Why doesn't that surprise me? By now you'll start spotting the people who go to these things quite often. Right, Tom is a set verb of the day because he's heard the solo touch on me and he's usually falling asleep at the back or making fun of the outfits I'm wearing. So he's going to describe this new structure. We've now got a piece of information so we now in advance of day, but not much further on. Is there anyone in the room who can tell me about five or six things about solo sets on the Mr. Swift or Third Volunteer yet? Anyone who can tell me five, six, four things about solo sets on the Three? Martin? I don't want to hear it. Come on, you, you, heard this, you heard this last week as well. No. Martin is more or less this. He's what we call multi-structural because he knows lots of facts about so much. Suppose he doesn't know how it works. Okay. Mr. Swig, to the front, please. This is a stage dive that he just speaks a lot to this guy. He uses to speak to something in front. Mr. Swig uses solar taxonomy in his lesson, so he applies the knowledge and actually uses it. I'll come back to what it actually is in a minute. So he's what we call relational. And then I'm the mug that stands at the front and talks about it, so I'm going to call it extended abstract. Now, this is how it works. So long as it's actually good, how you can increase the depth of people's answers. So we start a new topic, and we know absolutely nothing about it. I get that quite frequently in secondary class with children, right? We start a new topic, they don't have any clue what I'm talking about, unless I can make a direct reference to them. First thing I teach them, teach them one fact. But I need to make sure that one fact is actually relevant to the top I'm doing. So if they say, I've got a fact, sir, nothing to do with the topic, I don't want them to think that I'm okay, I can hide now. Build up my facts, and I've now got lots of answers, but what they to do with each other, I don't really know. Those of you teach English, this links quite directly as well to appeal, to point evidence, explain, and link. We were doing that last week. Now, Mr. Switch has gone to the next stage. He's taken those points, he's learnt about solo, he's learnt some ideas, and he's taken them into his PE lesson. And I know that because he's told me, he's tweeted about it, and he's deputy head has told me. So he's actually taken the ideas about different skills, and he's applied them into his lessons. And I know he's had a lesson on how to use solo, because I gave it to him in January, at some show where he stopped with a piece of paper. So, solo taxonomy is about the idea of learning things and things. Thank you, gentlemen, for your attention. I think they all deserve the prize. Volunteering. Um, so I've been using Sogo for about two years. I heard about it from various people on Twitter um, and got into a conversation where we chatted, a few of us chatted online, and a group of geographers decided to share the idea around. So we spoke to some people from Germany, sorry, UK, Abu Dhabi, Australia, and America. Not really practical to get together, so we did it over Twitter. The year after, we had 40 educators between Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Again, for an hour, we chatted about it, shared like this. And then on New Year's Eve, I was bored. I was sitting at home, and Jules Holland didn't start for another few hours, so I thought, let's start a network. Because there are lots of people out there using solar taxonomy, but they don't know how to connect with other people. So I started the Global Solo Network, which is a group on Twitter. Any educators who are interested in solar taxonomy or who are using it, and we do exactly what Martin said, we share resources. So we make our resources, we tweet about them, other people retweet them to sort of magnify them out and amplify them to other people, and we talk and we share ideas. Now I started that on New Year's Eve, so we are today, six months exactly from the day since I started it, and apart from the few people I see doing Anyone in the audience who doesn't know that site can guess how many people in the world are following that Twitter account after six months. Any guesses? 5,000. No one. Education for dentistry and various other subjects. 
It's used a lot in Australia and New Zealand, and they've written lots of books about it. In fact, the expert in solar taxonomy, Pam Hook, is based in New Zealand. If you think there's anything in it you might be interested in, see me later. I can give you a Mr. Swift explanation on a piece of paper. I can give you links to blogs and things where there's information about it. But it is a great way of showing children how to progress their work. There are various diagrams that we can use to help show them how to structure answers and scaffold them. And that's how I use it in the classroom to show my children how to make their work more detailed. How much time, Martin? Oh, oh, ten minutes ago. Ten, ten minutes ago, right. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the first one is technology. If you are a speaker, can you please give your simple paper to uh, Martin? I did set up a beautiful uh, random name generator. It took me about 20 minutes there, yeah? And then it's just for working out. Yeah? So, Martin has got all the bits of paper, I think. Right. I'm going to pick a name at random for our next presenter. Yes, she has a reasonable colour, but this is a child who does not finish work. 
And this young man, I promised, I would put him up a friendly liability, struggles to read and write, has a TA with him permanently, he's not independent at all. Miss, I don't want to answer the questions the way you put them. Can I never fold a book? He's never done that before. You've got a lot of it. This is what they say. This is their feedback. I do everything right. It's a big thing at the moment about student feedback to teachers about their lessons. This is how you do it. Completely harmless. They will just write something down. They can't write an essay. They will tell you what it is. But my takeaway point is that Mr. Go hates worksheets. I love pretty clever worksheets because it means I can take a hobby to school and I've got engaged kids. They're even better if it's about me focusing on those late starters, the ones I've always had back in the classroom. They are starting to come with me because they go, all this is one of your pretty coloured things. Have you put a pen on maps? That's the kind of question I now get. And the only other thing they've said is they didn't like the tips, they actually want their levels on there. So that's the one thing I changed, is about putting levels on the tips. So really all I'm saying is, number one, Twitter, steal everything. Number two, seven craft artists professional. I don't care what God says if I like much. September and she needs a beautiful mug from the caffeine that she'll be consuming.
accent already. I'm from Australia. I've worked 10 years as a marine mammal trainer uh, at SeaWorld. That is essentially training dolphins and seals for 10 years. It's pretty much like training children, essentially the same thing. Uh, and I always used to say a good trainer is not someone who gets the animals to do something, it's who gets the animals to want to do something. And I apply that in my teaching. It's not getting the students to achieve something, it's getting them to want to achieve it. Because if we want them to succeed more than they want it, then you're not, you've got an uphill battle the whole way. So my goal is to get my students to want to succeed. And how do I do this? Well, I give them uh, some tips. And these are sort of the seven habits that uh, we teach the students in the inner drive about how to be successful. And my favourite and the one I'm going to focus on today is about taking responsibility. It really is about teaching the students that it is your life, you have to take control of it. And I'm sure everyone in this room has heard this, uh, had this example happen to them before. Uh, it happened to my brother. He came home from school uh, and mum opened up his report card. He was in grade 10 and uh, she, he failed maths. And she asked him, why did you fail maths? This is the first time I've heard about this. And his answer was, teacher hates me. <laughs> now hands up if you've heard that before. Or said it when you were a student. Now of course we all know it's not the teacher's fault. Uh, at the end of the day, yes, they may have not a teacher that they get along really well with, or perhaps there were better maths teachers in the school at that time. But at the end of the day, it's about my brother taking responsibility, learning that his teacher is not his only resource. He has the internet. I didn't have the internet when I was you know, a lot younger, so he had that to, available to him. He has peers, he has other teachers. It's learning to build a team around you, taking responsibility. They're one, two of my favourite habits I teach on my students all the time. And avoiding the blame game. It's not the teacher's fault. So, a little quick little video for you, just a couple of really short videos. Uh, about uh, This is about cracking under pressure, and I use this in my classroom to so show students how to avoid cracking under pressure. Capable of delivering digital TV, whether it's live or recorded TV. <coughs> Audio, video, um, the main, main areas of business that I see this being aimed at are corporate businesses uh, for the, sorry, for the home environment where, for the disconcerting uh, home uh, professional. Nick. Now you get the idea, um, I'm sure you've all seen that show before, Dragon's Den, but the idea here is that when we are under pressure, often that's, I'm sure it might have happened to you before, but we get this sort of cloud of judgment, judgment in our front and low. And when we lose that focus, and you could see that exact moment where he just completely forgot everything, and I'm sure he'd been practicing for weeks before he went on Dragon's Den. But as soon as we kind of let the stress overtake um, you know, our planning, then these sorts of things start to uh, happen, you know, poor focus, poor memory, indecision, you just really make bad decisions and you forget everything around you. So I often uh, tell my students when something happens like that in the exam, these automatic negative thoughts come into your head, we call them ants, and the first thing to do when they say something, oh, I'm going to fail on this, straight away say stop, turn that around, and how are you going to make that positive? So turn. Uh, it around and say, I'm not going to fail, I've put in the work, I know what I have to put down on paper and that's what I'm going to focus on in the exam. So when they come to those questions and they freak out and they have never seen a word before, you know, teach science is quite often in their exams, they come across these words that they may never have seen before. But that's beside the point. They know what they have to put down on paper. Usually the answer is there within a graph or a table. So it's about teaching the students to not focus on what they can't change, not really focus on my can't influence at that point, but just control the controllables. So at that point in the exam, they can't control what the question is, they can't control how long they have for the exam, how long they have for the question, what they control is what they put down on paper. So I teach them about forgetting everything else around them and just controlling the controllables. I've got one last little video to sort of uh, finish on to show you as well um, how the power of positive language can help in the classroom. I love using these little clips usually as starters in my lesson particularly when they walk in after lunch and they're literally ready to fall asleep. So this is often wakes them up and gets them ready to go again. <laughs>
uh, little cards as well from the drive if you'd like to learn some more about that. <coughs> Thank you very much.
once you're filled in, the form is quite short. Uh, you'll be listed as a venue looking for volunteers. I'll be bringing them in there for a little while. I don't know if anybody near them. Now, there are additionally fringe benefits. Every volunteer, I think I've got that minute, maybe. Every volunteer who, um, who runs the code club obviously will bring their own unique skills, enthusiasm, and spirit. Um, they might just stick to the worksheets or they might work with the school to bring other fringe benefits. So, for instance, at the Code Club that I run, just in September, or November, sorry, we started, we've actually managed to bring into the school an additional 20 raspberry pies. Um, the students have entered the University of Manchester's Animation 14 competition, Microsoft's Coding Cup competition. Uh, we invited for the girls to get coding houses of Parliament demonstrations, we didn't get a place for that. Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, and we've got eight DIY then, again, gifts from the Technology and Trust coming in um, September. That's about 12 to 1500 pounds of technology. So very, very briefly, I'm going to allow one slide to say that uh, in addition to Code Club, Code Club have Code Club Pro, which is CPD for primary school teachers for the new IT curriculum. I'm a Code Club Pro trainer as well. So if you want to talk to me about that afterwards, um, I'll to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Send a secondary teacher here and some of the things that go on in primary school. And um, I think sometimes in secondary school we can sometimes sell our students a little bit short, like they can do coding and making their own programs and so on, and then we ask them to make a PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> it's true. Or a Prezi. Or a Prezi, yeah. That's, that's a lot. Um, okay, our next presenter is. Janet. <coughs> Yourself, because he turned the computer off. My phone is getting scrolled. What's my fault? Okay, well, that's getting up. I think we did have a few more entries into the remote competition. Um, we had Gemma, where's Gemma? Gemma was really particularly inspired. Um, she wants to feel like a champion after being inspired uh, by the Inquirer's uh, presentation. Um, and Mr. Swift seriously needs a mug um, because seriously I need a mug, she's sitting right next to me and helps her teach her out. <laughs> Keep those tweets coming. Well, actually, that's some more. You don't do it today. Um, Okay, a bit of shape is plugging here for me. 
I actually work with quite a number of schools, getting them to think about uh, the career's progression of their pupils. And one of the things I'm finding at the moment is head teachers are really worried about two things. Offset um, inspecting careers education now, and also destination data being published. Um, it will shortly, well there is consultation, it will, should shortly be on every school website in the sand of wine. So, of course, head teachers are going to be worried about that. Now, it also has an effect on the pupil's career path, it has a, an effect on their emotional well-being. We've all heard, oh, Facebook causes so much drama. It's not Facebook that causes the drama, it's what you put on Facebook that causes drama. And then finally, for all of you ICT pods, you've probably got a social media policy or a school internet use policy. Does anyone actually read that? Do the children understand what it actually means to them? There's a piece of research this morning about how many people read the terms and conditions on bank websites. 27% actually read the terms and conditions before they tick that little box and say yes. Of that 27%, 17% actually understand it. So how many of your young people understand what the social uh, media policy is in your school? So, thinking about the effect of social media. These are, are a couple of things that have happened. Office work has sat for branding work boring. You are sitting there on Facebook, so it's just well boring, isn't it? And a young girl <coughs> there who was turned down for work experience with a local MP because his Twitter account was foul mouthed and full of swear words. And of course, who could forget about Post Brown, who lost her job as the new police commissioner a short while ago? Okay. Kids are going to say to you, well, why would anyone bother googling me? Why would anybody look at me? Straight answer. This has come from a HR website and it physically tells employers to look up the people they're looking to employ or to put um, onto courses. So it says you can and should supplement your background checks with a web search. 78% of companies will Google your name before they employ you. However, web search is a great supplement to background checks because you can gain insight into who the person is. They're also looking for good stuff on the young people. So working with, the, um, working with your students to get them to tweet on uh, Facebook about great things they've been doing in school, in your lessons, is really, really important for them. Thank you. Okay, LinkedIn. Now accessible to 13 year olds. Children can go on there, put on videos, put on PowerPoints, etc., of things they've done with them in school. There's networking opportunities on there. Maybe they can get in with a local company and get a great holiday job or work experience um, chance, or even just a day work shadowing. And also finding volunteering op opportunities for the sick formers and so on. Obviously thinking about their safety, but making sure they utilise these last few years before they're out in the real world. So, the resources um, that have come out of this, thank you Penny, um, on my website you will find a resources section, and I use Pinterest for my resources, and there's lots of links there, there's lots of infographics and things that you can use to talk to the young people about their social media presence. Because I can bet a pound to a penny, someone will turn around to you and say, well, we're not doing anything that you didn't.